Well, good morning, and Lou, I want to thank you uh, for buying so many books. Um, you are now my number two salesman, right behind Paul Krugman. <laughs> I think you intended to help. I'm quite sure that he didn't. Uh, anyway, um, I do um, appreciate everybody's uh, coming out this morning to hear about this. Uh, but I, and I don't want to step on my own book, but I do want to give a, a slight warning that if you're listening to the Audible book while you're driving, be careful. It has generated several cases of road rage uh, already. <laughs> Um, so uh, just keep that in mind. Uh, I've actually been on the road now, so to speak, um, on the book tour for six weeks, and I've been very much looking forward to this morning because so far the book has been denounced by the left and the right and Republicans and Democrats and Keynesians and monetarists and supply-siders and Wall Street and K Street and the military-industrial complex and the neocons and the social cons and the just cons. And for, all of, for uh, all of you who haven't focused on all of those, the just cons are about everybody else left in Washington uh, when the other uh, categories uh, are taken into account. Um, but I know uh, there are uh, some people uh, who don't buy uh, all those theories, all those ideologies, and I think uh, a few of you are here today, and, and I'm very uh, appreciative the of the fact that you came out. Now, I think it's fair enough that there have been so many brickbats thrown at my book from so many points on the political compass because I do describe what has evolved over decades. This is kind of a revisionist history as uh, ending up in a crony capitalist dystopia uh, in which uh, capitalism is being eroded and undermined and basically disabled and in which political democracy no longer really functions in any uh, viable sense. It's more or less a money-driven, crony, uh, interest group, K Street-driven system. So I can understand why there were so many negative uh, reactions, but I do think when Professor Paul Krugman uh, responded to my book, he went over the top a little bit. Uh, as you know, he is the self-anointed and self-appointed uh, tribune of all matters uh, correct, uh, all correctness in economic matters. But when he said that my book was the raving of a cranky old man, uh, I thought that that was really a little too much. It even aroused my 85-year-old mother, who, uh, upon reading uh, his blog, which was entitled Cranky Old Man, uh, she shot back an email saying, doesn't he know? Uh, actually, you were a cranky young man, too. Um, and you apparently uh, you know, never got over it. But uh, apparently, there are a lot of cranky people in America because the day that his blog appeared, which was about the second or third day after the book was released, it shot right up to the top of the list. I was amazed, right up the Amazon list, and there were only a couple of things that stopped it, two diet books uh, and something called The Walking Dead, which I understand is uh, some kind of horror novel. But I was very pleased that he was so willing to help because the very first week uh, when the book came out, it ended up number four on the New York Times bestseller list. Now, I'm not saying that to boast or to give any uh, benefit to the New York Times. As a matter of fact, the bad side of this is they're still debating whether it was number four in the fiction or the nonfiction category. Uh, they haven't yet decided, and that debate may go on for a while. But uh, speaking of fiction, uh, that's really what the fundamental purpose of the book was and that is to kind of debunk and expose all the status myths and errors and nostrums and ideologies which drive governance in America today and in our entire system. And naturally, it took me a lot of space to do that because there, were, there was so much to correct. And as I got uh, deep into it, I had to go farther back in history in order to unravel all of this and get to the bottom. So what I would like to do today is maybe, uh, rather than drag you through the whole book, because that would take uh, more time than we have, just tick off a few of the uh, key kind of themes or propositions that I developed in the book, 
And then I really would, before we have to get to the book signing and all of that, uh, like to take uh, questions and uh, get some kind of uh, dialogue going here this morning. I started with what I call the Blackberry Panic, because the reason I actually wrote the book was in September 2008, I was so outraged when I saw a Republican administration panic enact uh, against the wishes of most of even the Republican members of the House and Senate, TARP, support uh, the uh, Federal Reserve as it got out all of its uh, monetary uh, uh, fire hoses, and essentially uh, flood uh, Wall Street with massive amounts of money, the bailouts of AIG and all of the Wall Street firms and the banks and GM and so forth. I thought that that was really a Rubicon and that either everything we believe about free markets and fiscal rectitude and all the rest of it uh, is wrong, or the facts that they were adducing uh, uh, are wrong. And so what I've tried to do in the book is lay out and tick off one by one the uh, arguments that were made and then the answers that I think are pretty persuasive that suggest uh, all of this was unnecessary and it started us down a path which will be very difficult to uh, reverse. Now, the, the biggest event in that uh, period, as you remember, is the AIG bailout. And what I try to show in the book is that the $180 billion that went to AIG was really not necessary, that the problem was in the holding company that had written the so-called credit default swap insurance, the holding company was actually based in London, for that matter. Uh, it had no liquidity, and as a result, had AIG been forced to go into bankruptcy, the credit default swaps at the holding company would have been uh, 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 total losses. The banks who uh, bought that insurance would have uh, suffered the loss, but if you look at the numbers I've laid out, you will see that it was uh, basically absorbable by the banking system. Uh, there were 20 large banks, including a lot of big European banks like Barclays and Sockgen, uh, Deutsche Bank, as well as the big US banks, that had bought the credit default swaps. But between them, they had $20 trillion worth of balance sheet. And if you look at the loss exposure on the credit default swaps, it's in the range of 60 billion. And so therefore, we're talking about less than 1% of the balance sheet of the huge global banks that had brought, bought the CDS in order to basically uh, arbitrage the banking regulations. And by that, I mean they were buying all kinds of CDOs and sub securitized subprime debt and so forth. But when you bought the CDS, which was triple A, you were able to magically transform your uh, you know, toxic assets, your high yielding CDOs, CDO squared, and all the rest of it into AAA credits. Therefore, you didn't have to put any post under the Basel regulations, any uh, equity on your balance sheet. You could harvest the nice income that was yielded uh, by these securities and get essentially an infinite rate of return. So it was a good game, but it was a bad bet because the insurance was no good. It was written by a holding company that didn't have liquidity. The holding company, AIG, was massive. It had, on its consolidated balance sheet, it had hundreds of billions of equity, but the thing was that equity was buried in all the insurance subsidiaries. And that's the part that was never made clear to the public and so the case was made over and over that we have millions of people who are going to lose their retirement annuities, or we have tens of millions of people that are going to lose their property and casualty coverage and so forth. But the truth was, all of that insurance was written by the subsidiaries, which were legally separate entities, almost all of them protected by state insurance commissions that had capital standards, that had dividend stoppers, meaning you couldn't take the cash out, you couldn't take the equity out in order to meet margin calls or other uh, payoffs for the CDS upstairs. 
So therefore, AIG was not a contagious economic disease that was going to pollute the entire financial system of the world and take everything down into some, in some kind of financial uh, black hole. As a matter of fact, if they had put AIG into bankruptcy, and I think this one is important because it then uh, started the ball rolling, had they put AIG into bankruptcy, all of the insurance subsidiaries would have been seized uh, or uh, protected by their uh, capital standards and their regulatory commissions at the state level for good or ill, they're there. And the idea that somehow this whole thing was going to unwind, that hundreds of billions of dollars would be taken out of the subsidiaries and used, uh, uh, liquidated, uh, that is good assets, bonds and stocks and so forth, liquidated into the market and creating a huge uh, further downward spiral I think was wrong. Nevertheless, when you did that, which was the day after the Lehman failure, it was a shocking thing to the whole world. AIG, and I uh, spent a lot of years, as Lou said, in the financial uh, world, AIG, up until then, was considered the gold standard of the financial system. And therefore, to see that AIG was suddenly, without warning, in an, almost in the equivalent of a nanosecond, a few days, suddenly on the verge of collapse and insolvency, uh, was a shock to the system. And therefore, it opened everyone's uh, mind, so to speak, uh, sp particularly in Washington, to the idea that everything's falling apart. We've been hit by some comet from deep space that has polluted our entire financial system uh, with uh, organisms, so to speak, uh, that uh, are dangerous and we can't understand. And so therefore, the dominoes fell one after another once the AIG bailout <clears throat> was established as the predicate. Pretty soon, they were saying things and people were believing things that weren't even remotely true. The next thing that happened after AIG, the shock the utter shock of AIG, was the uh, argument was made that the money funds were also unwinding and going into a great collapse. Now, what I lay out in my book is that at that time, there were 3.8 trillion of money funds outstanding, so that's a big number, and had there been some kind of huge run on the money market funds, that could have been a catastrophic problem, I'll admit to that. But when you looked at the numbers, what it showed is that half of that huge, huge number, the 3.8 trillion, half of it uh, consisted of so-called uh, government funds that had no commercial paper, that had no other risky paper in those funds. So that when the Lehman uh, failure occurred, and one of the big money funds uh, broke the buck, I think some of you remember that, that had nothing to do with half of that whole industry. There was no Lehman paper or any other toxic paper or any other risky commercial paper or so forth in uh, uh, the uh, 1.8 trillion money uh, or government fund part of it. Now, here's the uh, part that they didn't tell you. The other 1.8 trillion was basically uh, in funds that, uh, that held government paper bank paper, and a small amount of commercial uh, paper, including Lehman. And what happened during the crisis is that the prime funds, this is the other 1.8 trillion, had a drain quickly of about 400 billion, but what they didn't tell you was that almost all of that drain out of the prime uh, funds, which occurred because people wondered, well, if uh, uh, you know, there's Lehman paper in here, what else is in here? Almost all of it went across the street in the same money uh, market fund families to the government-only funds. In other words, people hit the send button and moved massive amounts of money, $400 billion roughly, to government-only funds. It didn't go into a black hole. It wasn't a uh, classic run on the market. It wasn't going to take anything down. It was a rational adjustment when investors realized that what they had been told all these years about prime funds, that they were money good, 100 cents on the dollar, was a marketing uh, exaggeration that wasn't true. 
So therefore, if you remember at the time, we had all of this notion that this great $3.8 trillion industry was coming unraveled. It was going to uh, you know, stimulate a contagion that hit the entire uh, financial system. Basically, it wasn't true. They waived the $400 billion number at congressmen who were lined up like sheep in these meetings uh, in order to get the votes on TARP and to get the sanction for what the Fed was doing. But in the end of the day, less than 60 billion of that 3.8 trillion actually left the money fund industry. It just moved from column A to column B, and even the 60 billion that left mainly went into uh, treasury paper and into bank CDs. So again, that was the second big event, and the whole scary story told at the time was that as the money market funds unraveled, the commercial paper industry would collapse. Uh, pretty soon, uh, payrolls couldn't be met. Uh, ATMs would go dark, all the rest of that. Uh, uh, again, that wasn't true. Now, the third thing they said at the time was that the banking system on Main Street would be the next to fall. In other words, we were going to have runs on the entire banking system. And my argument, which I lay out pretty well, I think, in the book, is that the runs were entirely in the canyons of Wall Street in the wholesale funding markets. And by that, I mean the repo market, the unsecured commercial paper. The last uh, gambling houses standing were basically uh, Goldman, Morgan Stanley, because by then, uh, Lehman was gone, uh, Bear Stearns was gone, America, or, uh, Bank America was picking up uh, Merrill Lynch and so forth. And so uh, the point was made, or the argument was made, that this was going to spread in some kind of crescendo to the entire Main Street banking system. Well, again, you have to look at the facts. And when I did the analysis and went through all the facts, what I found was that at that moment in time, that week of September 15, 2008, the banking system had something like 12 trillion of assets, but if you sort it through class by class, you find out that less than 100 billion of securitized mortgages, the so-called toxic paper, uh, CDOs, CDO squared, uh, mortgage-backed securities of one type or another, was uh, uh, in the Main Street banking system. Most of that paper was actually on the balance sheet of Wall Street banks or in hedge funds or had been distributed out to institutional investors around the world. And so again, the idea that we were going to have huge retail runs on the banking system just doesn't hold up. The facts aren't there, <clears throat> and, and as I try to lay it out, it wouldn't have happened. So all, overall, a huge mistake, I think, was made. And that was kind of a Rubicon in terms of where we're going uh, with a banking, a federal reserve system that's totally out of control with a fiscal situation that really uh, is getting more desperate by the day with the rules of free, uh, free markets uh, more or less set aside. Uh, all of it, I think, uh, the, uh, you know, uh, turned in a very bad direction uh, in uh, those moments uh, or weeks uh, during the BlackBerry panic. Now, uh, Bernanke did say at the time, and this is what I think put the fear into the whole system, that we were on the verge of the Great Depression 2.0. Uh, that I take on in my book, and I demonstrate it wasn't even remotely uh, uh, in front of the country, that the U.S. economy in 2008 had already offshored most of its industrial economy. We were no longer an exporter like we were in 1930, 31, and 32 when we did have uh, the Great Collapse. And as a result, our economy was structured differently and would not have plunged into a downward spiral that couldn't be stopped. Ninety percent of personal income was coming from transfer payments or government uh, salaries or the private service industry in the United States. That was not going to plunge into a huge process of inventory liquidation because, as a matter of fact, the sh facts show that in the first nine months it went in the opposite direction. Transfer payments went up enormously, automatically. Government salaries obviously were not cut. 
Uh, the layoffs were significant in the private service industry, but it didn't collapse like manufacturing and tradable goods and industrial, and, and industrial economy does uh, when you have a huge uh, decline like we had in the 1930s. So I have some facts in the book, again, which compare what happened in the early 30s with what happened in 2008, and it's rather startling. In the uh, early 30s, we were a massive creditor export power, a huge industrial manufacturing economy, so that when the post-29 collapse came, the economy had inventories, massive inventories, which you have in manufacturing, equal to about 35% of GDP. Inventories were liquidated over the next three years to the tune of about 50% of the starting point, and therefore there was a massive hunk taken out of the economy, about 17% of GDP, as a result of the industrial export economy and ag economy at that time, which was also a big exporter, liquidating in response to the collapse that occurred worldwide, not just uh, as a result of uh, 1929. And so that started a process in which everything declined dramatically. Personal consumption spending back then in the 30-32 time frame dropped by 20% as a result of wages uh, uh, collapsing and activity collapsing in the industrial economy. Well, you can go through all of it and you compare it to what happened in 2008 and you can see that it was totally a false alarm. In 2008, obviously the Hoovervilles that happened uh, 80 years ago were in China. They weren't here. The great export power in the industrial system of the world was in China, not the United States. So when our economy went into uh, adjustment after the uh, Lehman crisis, inventory liquidation amounted to 2% of GDP, not 17%, a huge different, uh, difference. Uh, the decline in personal consumption spending in real terms in the first nine months was about 2%, not 20%. And you can go through all the different numbers which are laid out in my book. And the point is, Bernanke was looking in a rearview mirror at what happened in 1930-32, assumed uh, inappropriately that it was going to happen this time, and then pulled out all the stops, spread the panic as the great scholar uh, of the uh, Great Depression all around Washington. He was given credit, unfortunately, uh, for being a uh, scholar of the uh, Great Depression, and in fact, I uh, try to lay out in the book that he wasn't, he simply Xeroxed Milton Friedman's erroneous theory uh, of how it all came about. And so, uh, again, when you overlay that onto the panic that was going on in the canyons of Wall Street, Great Depression 2.0 around, lurking around the corner, uh, the meltdown that was going on in Wall Street that would have burned itself out on its own, in my view, spreading to the rest of the economy and the Main Street banking system and so forth, you got a scenario that was totally inaccurate in terms of what the facts of life were. But it lives with us indefinitely because people still believe that somehow the system is so exposed to systemic risk to these outbreaks of contagion that we no longer can obs uh, observe any of the old rules, the old rules about free markets and the right to succeed or fail, and that uh, losses need to be absorbed privately as well as gains. Uh, the idea that uh, we ought to basically pay our bills in this country fiscally has been lost as well because the job of the government has now been uh, become to prop up the entire financial system because of these systemic weaknesses uh, and so forth that allegedly uh, were uh, revealed in the BlackBerry Panic of 2008. So uh, I spent uh, a fair amount of time on that in the book, and I wanted to talk about it as kind of an opening um, uh, 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 way to, to get at the book today, because I think that's where everything uh, went in the wrong direction. And we now have uh, uh, a process going on in Washington, 
where both parties have become reconciled uh, to the necessity of all this, uh, and therefore I think we no longer have any kind of honest competition of ideas left in the system. What we have is crony capitalism, what we have is some kind of temporizing process. If you look at the solution that came out of that whole crisis, Dodd-Frank, you realize that that's an exercise in pure regulatory petty foggery. Uh, it is not going to change anything. It'll keep the lawyers and the accountants uh, and the consultants busy for years to come. But it doesn't address what went wrong at the central bank. It doesn't address uh, what uh, really happened uh, in the BlackBerry panic of 2008. So uh, those are a few thoughts that I wanted to launch here this morning. There's a lot more, obviously, in the book. But uh, why don't I stop at that and try to respond to questions that may uh, relate to what I've just said or anything else that goes back to the 1930s. Thank you. Okay, over here. Mr. Stockman, I have a daughter following your footsteps who's a, uh, an aide to a congressman. She said to me the other day uh, that, uh, she said, Daddy, the law is only there until you need it. How do you think the evisceration of the rule of law vis-a-vis -vis bankruptcy and GM, et cetera, how does that play out going forward? Yeah, well, I think that is a really good point, and I mean, it's the essence of what, what went wrong in 2008. They said that the bankruptcy law wasn't adequate to handle the AIG uh, uh, crisis. It certainly was. I have another whole section in the book about GM. The idea that GM couldn't get a dip loan, that GM couldn't have gone into bankruptcy the normal way is so much <clears throat> urban myth, urban legend. And I point out in the book that in the quarter that they filed, you know, their 10Q, the quarter before the bailout in the fall of 2008, GM had $150 billion worth of assets on their balance sheet. Now, some of them uh, were worth less than 100 cents on the dollar, but in that were massively valuable assets, including all their plants, their distribution system, their brands, their foreign subsidiaries, uh, which uh, some of them uh, were highly valuable in Brazil, China, and so forth. And the point of a bankruptcy is in bankruptcy, you get to prime all the other liabilities that have a claim on those assets. So there were 150 billion of liabilities, but those were unfunded pension. They would go to the back of the line and ultimately uh, to the uh, uh, Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation. There was $50 billion worth of bank loans and debt. They would have gone to the back of the line. There was 30 or $40 billion worth of unfunded medical, uh, retiree medical benefits. They would have gone to the back of the line. So the point that I try to lay out in the book is the argument that GM couldn't get a dip loan that would be secured by all of those assets uh, was uh, really incredible. It wasn't true, and yet it was the excuse that, frankly, Paulson made to bail out GM uh, in December 2008. Now, as a result of that, essentially what happened is we turned a big industry in the United States into a political food fight uh, as to where the automotive production is going to occur, either south of the Mason-Dixon line or north. In other words, there wasn't going to be a shortage of cars. There, there was enormous excess capacity, particularly in the transplant auto assembly plants in Alabama and Tennessee and Kentucky and Mississippi and South Dakota, I mean, South Carolina, uh, Georgia, and so forth. The issue was, were those uh, cars demanded uh, by the uh, economy, once the economy uh, settled down, were they going to be produced uh, in these new uh, efficient transplant uh, operations where the weighted average uh, cost, uh, uh, fully loaded cost, I should say, uh, of employees was about 60000 a year? Or were they going to be made in the broken down, run down UAW undermined plants uh, in Ohio, Michigan, and Wisconsin uh, that paid 100000 a year? That's all it was about. 
And if you go through all the facts, and I've laid them out uh, pretty well, I think, in the book, essentially uh, what the bailout did was move 40,000 jobs from the transplant auto belt in the south, that, and also which happened to be red states uh, in the uh, electoral college, and move them uh, to the uh, blue states uh, and the auto uh, plants that uh, were rescued uh, in Ohio, Michigan, and a few other places uh, in the Rust Belt. Now that's what, that's what happened. And when you have the power of government, when you have the power of the state being used to move jobs in this manner um, uh, for no uh, justifiable reason, except who has the most political clout, uh, and in this case, uh, from right to work states uh, to uh, uh, union states, <clears throat> it's just another indication of how far we've drifted from a workable system. Now, what I worry is that since they were able to uh, overcome the bankruptcy predicate, and that's what should have happened to GM and Chrysler, in that crisis, where are we going to be when you have the next crisis and the next crisis and the next crisis? The precedents are all there. And what happens is they will argue that it's so big and the consequences are so great that we have to basically throw out the rule of law and in, implement instead kind of discretionary, seat of the pants, <clears throat> uh, subjectively driven use of political power, and that's exactly what happened in the auto bailout. Even though the Wall Street bailout, I think, was horrible, it shouldn't have happened, uh, those firms that would have gone down could have been reorganized, they'd probably be a lot more prudent operators today. But I think the GM case was even worse because it has left the myth, which gets repeated over and over, and you heard it in the last campaign, that the automobile industry was saved that a, hundred, that a million jobs were on the line uh, heading uh, for you know, some kind of uh, economic uh, black hole, and that uh, government uh, broke the rules, but it was necessary in a desperate circumstance to deal with what would have been otherwise an Armageddon scenario. Now, that is really what the received wisdom is today. That's what uh, the current incumbent of the White House was saying on the campaign trail in uh, uh, 212. And none of it is remotely true. The auto industry wasn't going to collapse. It's a question of where the production was going to occur. And yet, today, <clears throat> we have now revived and reestablished uh, a bailout predicate, an interventionist predicate, that is far more powerful than anything that existed even uh, in the 1990s or the 1980s or 1970s when we di did some of the earlier smaller bailouts. Uh, so again, that's why I call our system crony capitalism because it is based on arbitrary, discretionary, and panic use of state power to alter outcomes that do not allow the market to work, and as a result, you get enormous moral ha hazard, obviously, and you get uh, an economic system that becomes less and less productive and flexible over time. Question over here. Yes. This is Dr. The basic premise is that Bernanke extrapolated the paradigm of the Great Depression inappropriately paradigm of Lehman Brothers uh, Blackberry right. crisis. And that as a result, America has been transformed, maybe even irreparably, to this lawless, I would call fascistic system. Isn't it possible that as Rahm Emanuel said, you know, never let a good crisis go to waste, that that was their goal to begin with? Um, well, I, um, I think if you... <laughs> Uh, when you look at how unlikely all these different uh, interventions were, you might uh, come to that conclusion. But I don't think it was intentional. I think it was uh, a panic reaction, a seat of the pants series of events. One begat the next. And as a result, uh, unfortunately, precedents have been established and myths have been, mythologies have been created <clears throat> 
that will now drive the system next time uh, and next time. So I don't think there were people there saying, oh, we have a crisis, now we can do what we always wanted to do. I don't think so. But I do think you had people in power who basically didn't have any real economic principles, uh, didn't really understand uh, what makes uh, capitalism work, why you need free market pricing in the financial markets and in all other markets for that matter, and why you can't just constantly throw the state, its treasury, and the taxpayers in the breach if you expect to have a solvent and a viable and sustainable system over time. So I think basically um, the opportunism of our political system uh, caught up uh, with us in uh, 2008. And unfortunately, it was the conservative party that failed in the largest sense of the word because they were supposed to be you know, the guardian of fiscal rectitude. The Republicans uh, in a uh, you know, competitive democracy like we have, have the job of hard labor on the oars of fiscal rectitude in telling the public sometimes there's going to be pain, sometimes there's going to be dislocation, sometimes we have to say no, uh, we can't uh, manage uh, daily economic life through the instruments and uh, agencies of the state. Now that's what the Republican Party was required to do in 2008. They didn't do that because by then they had appointed Greenspan and after that Bernanke. They had put uh, basically Keynesian uh, money, uh, ma uh, you know, money uh, banker, central bankers in charge of our economy. They had bought the myth that the Fed somehow was making uh, all of this prosperity possible through its deft maneuvering in the financial markets and management of interest rates and, and so forth. And the whole thing was a gigantic error that created serial bubbles. And when the great bubble finally broke in 2007 and 2008, they couldn't recognize how they had gotten to that point. And you had a Wall Street guy sitting <clears throat> on the third floor of the Treasury uh, who uh, basically panicked. <clears throat> I've said um, that Actually, if you look at it, it appears that the reason we had the bailouts and TARP and all of that madness is the occupiers were in control. But the occupiers that I'm talking about were the uh, people occupying the third floor of the Treasury, uh, who mostly came from Goldman Sachs, who uh, did not have a large view of public policy, but simply a narrow, short-run view looking at their blackberries of where the stock price of Goldman or the S&P 500 index or the Russell 2000 or any of the other ones uh, were trending down at the moment. And uh, it is a uh, powerful lesson because I am now convinced that Washington basically is driven by the stock market. They will not do anything by way of reimposing sound policy or reestablishing <coughs> fiscal rectitude or changing the mandate of the Fed um, because there will be such a vicious sell-off in all of these artificially inflated markets so fast that it will scare them into retreat even if they wanted <clears throat> to do something different. That's clearly what the lesson of the second TARP vote is. The first time they voted it down, as you remember in the House, <clears throat> the market dropped 600 points that day and it wasn't even that day. The market was dropping as you watch the uh, uh, you know, time on the voting clock uh, tick off. And so therefore, we now have uh, essentially a governance process <clears throat> that is driven by fast money traders and uh, trading robots on Wall Street. And uh, if you think that's a rational system, if you think that's uh, 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 survivable and viable and stable, uh, then, you know, you're uh, dreaming about something that couldn't be true in the real world. But that's where we are. The whole system has now become hostage to, uh, you know, the uh, gambling halls that have been created by the Fed and the puts and the easy money and the manipulation of the yield curve and uh, uh, so forth, the whole syndrome of uh, deformations that stem uh, from a rogue central bank. Over here. Yeah. Speaking more to 
how the policies of the Federal Reserve are in the, result in the subsidy to and the wealth transfer to the Wall Street Bank. Yeah. Yeah, uh, the question was about the Federal Reserve and the what we call interest repression or financial repression. Obviously, we know that the Fed has not repealed the law of supply and demand. Uh, and we know that the Fed is now buying six, seven, eight billion of uh, securities, mostly government treasury paper, but some uh, mortgage-backed securities every day that that is fundamentally distorting pricing uh, and undermining price discovery in the financial markets. And so therefore, none of the interest rates that you see or the price of money are real free market prices. They're essentially rigged, administered prices set by the Fed as a result of the huge uh, presence in the market every day absorbing this enormous amount of paper. Uh, it would not be remotely the case, in my judgment today, that you would have a five-year interest rate on the, I mean, an interest rate on the five-year treasury at 80 basis points, or that even the 10-year, which is trading at about 1.95 today, would be remotely there. That isn't a market price. That is a pegged, rigged price set by the Fed because of the enormous purchase they're making, something like half of all the flow in the middle uh, part uh, of uh, the yield curve. So therefore, if you start with the fact that the Fed has put the overnight rate at zero, the funds rate, put it there or established it there in December 2008 and has promised to keep it there until mid-2015, um, and that it's then heavily intervening uh, along the rest of the yield curve, you have basically a pricing system in the government market and in related <clears throat> fixed income markets that reflect the intentions and uh, the purposes of the Fed and not the result of the market. Now, one of those things is to drive the yield on about eight billion or eight trillion worth of deposits in the United States, bank deposits, down to close to zero. On a six month CD today, I guess it's something like uh, 40 basis points, uh, or maybe not even that. And as a result of that, I believe the Fed policy, this financial repression, the rigging of the yield curve and all the interest rates that I've talked about, uh, causes the depositors of America, the savers of America, to be deprived of two to 300 basis points worth the normal interest that would come in a market where prices or interest rates were being set uh, uh, by supply and demand uh, for savings and borrowing in the free market. Now, if you do the math on that, you will see that that adds up to about a 300 to 400 billion dollar transfer from depositors and savers in the banking system to the banks. And this is basically how the banks have gotten well. All of that then gets uh, booked as uh, net income and retained earnings and their balance sheets get better. But it's all come out of the hides of savers in America and depositors that would never happen on the free market. And so the, the uh, simple way to look at it, I think, is to ask yourself, if you put, that's really a fiscal transfer. That's not monetary policy, that's a fiscal transfer. And if you put that up to a vote in the Congress, it wouldn't even get to the floor. I mean, it would be uh, it would be uh, laughed out of the uh, committee rooms because there's no way that the public in America would condone transferring three to four hundred billion a year from savers who want to keep liquid, who want to uh, only in, uh, put money in safe uh, accounts and don't want to speculate in the stock market or buy a junk bond fund or the rest of it. Um, th that wouldn't have a chance uh, of approval, and yet. The 12 members of the, open, of the uh, Fed Open Market Committee, what I call the Monetary Politburo of the United States, basically has decided that in its wisdom, it is going to make the economy work better, grow faster, become more prosperous by driving you as a depositor out the risk curve, as they say, to use their clinical terms. But what they're really saying is we want you uh, to take another dive. We've already had three market crashes in the last, since the turn of the century. But we want you back into the risk assets, the Russell 2000 uh, high yield uh, bond fund or something, 
uh, because that will ignite a wealth effect, and as soon as we can get everybody thinking they're wealthier, then they'll spend more money, uh, and the economy will start working better. I mean, it is a terrible doctrine. Uh, it is a uh, terrible abuse of power that the Fed uh, is undertaking, and at the heart of it is this huge transfer that goes to your question um, of wealth arbitrarily uh, from the deposit and savings uh, classes of America to the banking system, um, and uh, it is uh, only a small part uh, to be uh, truthful of the deformations that come from the rogue central bank that we have operating in this country today, and frankly, uh, around the world. They're all doing the same thing, copying the same policies. Nowhere does this manifest itself more clearly than uh, what's going on in the EU, its desperate attempt to sustain a broken monetary system revolving around the euro, uh, to the detriment of, again, sovereign interests. I guess uh, the paragraph that you just identified here in the United States took place during TARP, which you astutely identified, smacks at the same coercion whereby the goal is to have the elected government take a back seat to the money, the money interest. Here's my question. Um, do you think it's possible that this was a manufactured financial meltdown? It was an attempt by sponsors of uh, visionaries of the New World Order, uh, high up in the decision-making chain, to facilitate the eventual creation of the single world, world currency and the one world government. I, mean, I know it's back to conspiracy theory, but one really has to start to wonder what uh, between what's happening with the ECB, the Federal Reserve, the Bank of Japan, the Bank of England. I mean, it really is got to the point where our world is controlled by monetary interests and no longer elected government and sovereign interests. Is this something that is being done deliberately? Okay, um, I would say I don't think so. Uh, uh, either stupidity is contagious <laughs> or there is a uh, conspiracy. I would rather think stupidity is contagious. And if, as we look at all of the central banks of the world, they're all doing the same thing. The Bank of England is a disgrace. I mean, this is where allegedly sound central banking started. And for a while, it did uh, follow the rules. There was a gold standard. It did work for 200 years. But now, when you look at the rate that they're spent, uh, expanding their balance sheet and the doctrine they're following, it's the very same thing that we're doing here. The Bank of Japan has taken it one step further. Uh, they, they've gone off the deep end. This is pure lunacy. They're going to increase the size of the balance sheet. Uh, in two, they're going to double it in two years. It would be the equivalent of the Fed printing uh, $5 trillion worth of new balance sheet. Yeah. No, but I, I think it's just... No, I don't think so. Uh, I, I, I much rather uh, prefer the stupidity uh, uh, line of reasoning than the conspiracy. Because when bad ideas get established, uh, and they seem to work in the short run, okay? In the short run, uh, you know, uh, heroin does seem to give people a high. It kills them in the long run. And what's happening is all the central banks of the world are scrambling to try to prop up economies prop up banking systems that are on the verge of insolvency. All the European banks in France and in the southern uh, tier, most of those banks are only there because they're, uh, they're only still solvent because of sovereign support. Uh, the governments uh, are running out of balance sheet, running out of capacity to borrow in honest capital markets, and so everything is being pushed into the venue of central banks. So we have a world economy, roughly 70 or 80 trillion of total GDP, as they measure today, being run by eight or nine central banks who are in a race to the bottom, all doing the same thing. I would say the People's Printing Press of China, as I call their central bank, uh, has created money even more rapidly over 10 or 15 years than the Fed has. Uh, 
pegging their currency to keep their mercantilist export model working, and in the process, buying dollars uh, in order to keep their currency pegged uh, and uh, taking in um, to their vaults massive amounts of treasury paper uh, gov uh, uh, um, and uh, government uh, or mortgage-backed security paper uh, in the process. So uh, you can see that in the numbers, which are quite startling. Uh, by the year 2000, before this really got bad, I mean, Greenspan led the charge and pretty soon everybody uh, was in line. But in the year 2000, all of the central banks of the world had combined footings of about $2 trillion, uh, combined balance sheets. Today, it is $15 trillion, and it's growing by two and a half trillion a year. If you look at the quantitative easing of Japan, the United States, the Bank of England, the ECB, and uh, the, the growth of the balance sheet uh, in uh, China, that's what's going on. So there is no honest pricing left anywhere in the world. Money, fast money, hot money is flowing back and forth, chasing currencies, chasing trades, chasing momentum until it stops and then it moves in another direction. This is a very dangerous, unstable system. And I don't think it was created by a conspiracy uh, because that could be exposed. I think it was created by stupidity and that's hard to uproot. That's the problem. Yeah, uh, okay, that could be true. Okay, there's a question over here. <clears throat> well, I think we're going to revert to something. We're in totally uncharted waters. If you would have asked people in 1995, do you think the uh, central banks of the world could be in this fantastic race to the bottom, this massive daily balance sheet expansion, uh, uh, you know, uh, vacuuming up uh, most of the sovereign debt and a lot of related? If you would have asked people in 1995, is this likely, I don't think one out of 100 people would have, uh, I mean experts, would have thought it possible. So today we're there, there is no precedent. You can talk about your other country uh, hyperinflations in history, but what happened in Argentina, uh, you know, or what happened in Zimbabwe, or what happened in Weimar Republic, Germany, is, is such a, a small, limited, historically contained episode that it really doesn't tell us a lot about what happens when there are nine out of control central banks in this fantastic uh, money printing and uh, spree and balance sheet expansion that's underway. So as a result of that, I don't know where the system is going, <laughs> whether it's going to bitcoins or gold or uh, who knows what. I just don't think this system is sustainable much longer. Uh, th this is really now in the late stages uh, of a uh, highly um, uh, uh, dangerous uh, and unstable process. And there is going to be some kind of major monetary collapse, disorder, breakdown that will require, if uh, we're not going to go back to uh, the caves, <laughs> uh, will require a major reconstitution uh, of uh, the financial system uh, and the banking systems of the world. How that gets done, uh, I don't think any of us uh, have a clue. We might have ideas of what should be done, and maybe this is a chance to restore sound money and uh, go back to a gold standard or go back to very narrow, limited purpose uh, central banks. Uh, but when you have a collapse of the magnitude that is indicated by the uh, momentum underway, I think it's very hard uh, to predict how it comes out. Now people say, well, what should we do here? One of the simple ideas that I keep proposing uh, as I've gone around on this, is why don't we at least go back to the central bank that Carter Glass had in mind in 1914 when the Fed was created. Uh, and basically that was a banker's bank. It only operated through a discount window. 
In other words, there was no open market committee. It was not legal for the original Federal Reserve to even buy or own government securities. It couldn't target anything, not M1, not M2, uh, not uh, the unemployment rate or the inflation rate or the number of housing starts or the Russell 2000, which is what Bernanke wants to target, or the number of jobs created per month, which is what uh, Evans, one of the other central bank governors, wants to target. There was no targeting of anything. GDP and economic expansion occurred on the free market, and the outcome was what it was. That's what people believed before 1920. And the role of the central bank was simply to take collateral based on commercial paper that represented real economic activity, inventory or receivables in the process collection, and loan against that uh, at a discount or a penalty rate uh, to banks that wanted to uh, liquefy some of their collateral in order to meet depositor uh, demands. Now that kind of uh, expansion or contraction of reserves in the banking system would be driven by the banking system, would be driven by real business activity and not by a Politburo of planners sitting in the Eccles building saying, we think we need to notch up uh, GDP growth from 3.1% to 3.3% next quarter or boost the housing starts you know, from a million to a million two. None of this would have occurred, none of this targeting and therefore central planning of the GDP and all of its elements would have occurred under the uh, idea of the glass uh, bank, the banker's bank, uh, the discount window uh, philosophy. The discount window uh, would have been driven by free market interest rates. So if there was a lot of speculation and borrowing going on in the market, interest rates would rise, the discount window would offer liquidity to banks, but at this rising market rate, it could even be double digits, and at a penalty above that, only on good collateral. That uh, was uh, you know, a version of a central bank, if you're going to have one, that uh, would have avoided this uh, massive disaster that we're in today. Now the reason I bring it up is simply if you want something practical, if you want some way to back off this enormous uh, disaster that we're drifting into now, at least reviving the idea of what the original uh, banker's bank model was like might uh, be a starting point for the debate because uh, it would uh, illuminate uh, it would uh, expose the fact that today uh, we uh, basically have a central bank running the economy through the crude tools of, the dis of uh, interest rate uh, management, yield curve uh, management, the various puts and all the other things that they're doing. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.